Thank you, course. Thank you. And greetings, parents and friends, and the great graduating class of 2022. Congratulations. The Nobel Prize winning novelist Thomas Mann, who if you haven't read in high school, you will in the coming years, gave these words to one of his characters who might have been himself. He said, I stand between two worlds, at home in neither. Many great artists, particularly writers, feel something like that, interpreting two worlds to one another. It requires insight and humanity, and it's one of the highest contributions of art to our world. Baratunde Thurston, our speaker today, is a comedian, a writer, a television uh, producer and host, an award-winning podcaster, a journalist and a commentator. But reading him and watching him in his widely acclaimed 2019 TED Talk, I would say that most of all, in the humanity of his thought, passion, and works, particularly on race in our country and our times, this class of 1995 Sidwell alumnus is an artist like man, an artist standing between two worlds. Born in the district, his first home and world was on Newton Street in Columbia Heights off 14th. He entered Sidwell in that second world in the seventh grade with his own with its own way of doing and saying things. He adjusted and he, he learned that fitting in also meant standing out. As he said on Sidwell's podcast, Lives That Speak, last year, and these are his words now, I remember coming home by bus one day and somebody saying, oh, you're going to that white school. Or maybe, why do you talk that way? So I'd get criticized at Sidwell for talking like I'm from Newton Street and criticized on Newton Street for talking like I was at Sidwell. His initiation to journalism was at our own horizon. A friend told him he's a good writer and to try out, he did, loved it, and it became a huge focus of his time. Late nights at the printers, the whole drill. And his love of comedy began here too. His early favorites? Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy, and Lake Wobegon. Talk about two different worlds. From Sidwell, he went to Harvard, wrote for the Crimson, studied philosophy, got into satire. An email newsletter he started while in the upper school here caught on. It was, he said, a little pocket to develop my voice. From there, he went to The Onion, my paper of record, and later The Daily Show, or The Evening News. He advised the Obama administration on a variety of topics and became a best-selling author with his book, How to Be Black. He's now a widely sought-after speaker, hosts several very popular podcasts, including How to Citizen with Baratunde. We're having a moment, and Spit, which uh, he had no copyright problems uh, with that podcast title, but it's a fascinating podcast regarding DNA. You should see him again on TV very soon, on July 5th, on PBS, uh, where he'll be hosting a new travel and adventure series called American Outdoors with Baratunde Thurston. His voice is heard throughout the nation, and I'm betting much of the world. It's a voice of criticism, but also of optimism, a voice that is candid about the past and hopeful for the future, an American voice and a Sidwell one. My friends, Bertunde Thurston. I mean, that's quite this build-up, Mark. 
Thank you. Uh, can we get some applause for Mark, for Brian, and for the ageless Monsieur Gay, please? <laughs> Masks really mess with the beard, so we got to get that right. Um, hello, everybody. Hello. I'm going to do that one more time. Hello, everybody. What a day to commence. Perfect weather, barometric pressure is just right. A few miles from here, we might be holding insurrectionists accountable. It's a good day. It's a good day. DC, it's good to be back here. It's changed since. I left in 1995. D.C. is, uh, well, it's got more white people than I remember. Um, Sidwell's also changed since I left here. Sidwell has less white people than I remember. <laughs> we live in some interesting times. Up is down. It is amazing to be back here at Sidwell Friends. The school is incredible. The campus alone is award-winning. We are right now live in a subterranean nuclear-proof Olympic athletic bunker, and it's very special. I read that they're going to make this entire campus not carbon neutral, carbon negative. Carbon negative. It means it sucks in more carbon than it emits. Now, that's the same relationship the school has with your parents' bank accounts, right? <laughs> So you'll definitely get the money back. You'll definitely get it back. It's called sustainability. Look it up. Look it up. Yo, Sidwell is so impressive. I wish I went here. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> That's not supposed to happen. So can we just have a moment of silence for how lucky we are to be here? I've had some amazing experiences in my life. I wrote a best-selling book. I worked for The Daily Show. I stole some pens from the White House once, <laughs> though technically we all pay for those pens, so I was reclaiming my property. <laughs> but if you ask me what I want to do next, I might say I want to go to high school at Sidwell right now, and that's not supposed to happen. So my first piece of advice to you, never come back. Get out, don't look back, because if you come back, they're going to have made it so much better than when you were here. And then you're going to feel a certain type of way. You'll have bitterness and jealousy inside. So just run as fast as you can. I got some congratulations, and I want to start with the obvious. You did it. You, like, stayed up late into the night. You stressed over college admissions. You wondered if you were good enough or smart enough. And the answer came back a resounding maybe. <laughs> so congratulations to the parents of the class of 2022. Let's be real. You paid for these diplomas. This is your day. You literally have the receipts. Today is the first day of the rest of your lives. You got a kid through high school. That's amazing. You should be very proud of yourselves. Uh, really, I want to congratulate the people who actually brought us here today, who put in countless hours in the classroom, who put in countless hours into clubs and sports teams, balancing learning in person, online, with a mask, without a mask. You put up with entitled, insufferable people who email at all hours demanding attention and special treatment. And you had to deal with students. Congratulations to the faculty and staff who ushered this crew through. It's going to go for a while. <laughs> Seriously, congratulations to the people receiving these diplomas today. You actually did the assignments and you passed the assessments, or at least enough of them to be here today. You survived a pandemic. That wasn't in the cards. You helped run student-led workshops on equity and justice and community day. 
You got to experience the last mixed class advisories in Sidwell history. You won, I think, every basketball title that could be won. I think the girls are winning in the multiverse now. I can't even keep up. <laughs> Earth Prime is afraid of y'all. Two of you even joined Truth Social, so the rest of us don't have to. So thank you for your service, Julia and Dylan. It's good to see community service. It's still part of the community here at Sidwell. Apparently, y'all play cahoots, like, a lot. <laughs> like, a lot. <laughs> You did senior projects that make me jealous. Chess tutorial videos, blacksmithing, and if I'm reading correctly, going to baseball games. I like that one. You, whoever did that one, you won, Sidwell. That's the best $35,000 plus I've ever heard of. <laughs> You've been a part of so many clubs. Robotics, BGS, I love your hair too. Mental health awareness. And I look forward to the day when we don't need mental health awareness clubs in any of our schools, because it's just a given. But thank you for what you've been doing on that score. I read something in Horizon, the paper I used to write for, and I, I need to share it with all of you, because I think it really captures the Sidwell spirit. The paper writes, lunch is the sole period of time at which clubs are easily able to meet. Lunch, however, is an important time to finish studying for tests and doing homework for many students, preventing individuals from attending meetings. I just want to offer another perspective. Lunch is also a time for lunch. <laughs> you can eat then. It's incredible. I remember so much from my time at this school. I did my first protest when I was at this school against the Justice Department around the Rodney King verdict, against this administration around other issues. I remember building a parabolic microphone as extra credit in physics class. I remember the community service. I remember accidentally joining the wrestling team and getting my ass kicked on a regular basis. <laughs> I remember rehearsals in the Arts Center more than I remember the performance, the bonding backstage. I remember Coach Gold. Yo! Yo! <laughs> and I have, I have a theory about Coach Gold and Monsieur Gay. Um, I think they're time travelers from Wakanda because <laughs> neither of them is aged today, and it's really freaking me out. So I need to put that on the record. I remember my advisor, Mr. Kirby. I remember the many buses and trains I took to get here. I remember being on the bus to track meets and that bonding time. And the good news is when you leave Sidwell, you don't really leave the school. When I got to freshman year at Harvard, I took this calculus class. They handed out the textbooks, and it was my Sidwell math textbook. I took this writing class called expository writing. I thought I was a terrible writer, but according to them, I was amazing because of the education I got here at Sidwell. When I was meeting kids in my dorm room, there was a kid down the hall, Andrew, and uh, he went to St. Albans, so I didn't talk to him. You know, it was just like, <laughs> how'd you get here? You know what I mean? Like, Sidwell taught me that, you know? Tell me to judge people before knowing the content of their character just because of where they're from. <laughs> I remember being, and this is like the weirdest humble brag I can say, but it's just a true story. I remember being in a meeting at the White House <laughs> and looking up and seeing another Sidwell kid from my class, John Bernthal, in the room, and we're both like, what are you doing here? <laughs> so welcome to the Illuminati. got nice benefits, like free pens. <laughs> Here's what I'm supposed to say to you. You're the future. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Find your passion. Tomorrow will be better. You're the most capable generation of humans in the history of the species. <laughs> I don't know you like that, maybe. <laughs> I know you got a dope poet. Like, I just heard that. That's first-hand account. Everything else is just hearsay. I'm supposed to tell you it's your turn to get out there and fix the world your powerful parents screwed up. 
I see you powerful parents. Yeah. <laughs> this is what we tell young people. It's all up to you. You're going to save us. These problems are yours now. Good luck. <laughs> Climate, systemic oppression, bad Wi-Fi, get on that. <laughs> you need to ignore those people. That's bullshit advice. That's like a parent saying to their kid, go clean up your room and clean up mine while you're at it. <laughs> people who tell you it's your job to save the world, ignore them unless they're down to help you do it. That's how we get this done. We are in a state right now, not technically we're in a province or a district or some kind of undemocratic territory, but metaphorically speaking, we are in a state. That was a DC statehood thing. I expect some support for that in this room. <laughs> unless you don't believe in democracy either. <laughs> But seriously, the world is topsy-turvy, it's volatile, it is hitting pretty hard. And I remember absorbing a lot of news ever since I was in school at Sidwell. And when I look at the news, I see a lot of bad news. All I hear about is everything that's on fire. I never see the people trying to put that fire out or build fire retardant structures to begin with. So along the way, I made this podcast called How to Citizen. And we were featuring and continue to feature people who are doing things to interpret citizen as a verb. We know that meaning when it's a, a noun, when it's used to separate folks based on paperwork, us versus them. But we also know people who lack that paperwork, who are contributing more to their communities than those who are legal. So let's remix it, let's reframe it, let's redefine citizen as a thing we can do, as a verb, as a way to actually participate. And my wife and I were developing the foundation of this show and she said to me that we need to be clear about what we think it is before we start telling anybody else. So we studied the sacred text, we read the Constitution, all of Wikipedia, it took a while. <laughs> and we came back with these four elements to citizen as a verb. Number one, it means to show up and participate. You just assume you got a role to play. A lot of us are trained to see ourselves as witnesses, but not participants. This democracy thing is a sport, so get in there. Number two, invest in relationships with yourself, with others, with the planet around you, because the myth we've been taught that there's a separation between those things is just that, it's a myth. Number three, understand power. We are in this system of people power, but we don't get taught what power is, or maybe it's something other people have that we don't get. There's powerful people and those without. That's not true. Power is something we can generate, comes in many forms. Could be money, could be physical force, could be attention. Where you place your attention is where you place your power. And number four, we do all these things to benefit the collective self, not just the individual self. Our very first guest was this woman, Valerie Kaur, and she wrote a beautiful book, See No Stranger. She said, a stranger is a part of me I do not yet know. So when we see that, when we see someone else as part of ourselves, we're less challenged about helping somebody else, because that's also helping ourselves. So I could go on and on about all these principles, but instead I'll tell you one story about the relationship one. Back when I was here, I was not like a ladies' man in any stretch of the word. Moms loved me, which was a death knell for the girls. Right? <laughs> Why don't you date that Baratunde? He's such a nice guy. That's it. That's over. That never happens after that. <laughs> so it means when I started to actually have relationships of my own, I was just excited that somebody liked me. I'm like, this is great. And I thought what it meant was locking things down. You fall in love. You coast forever. Ride this till the wheels fall off. But the problem is, that person has the nerve to change. And then I have the nerve to change. And now we're two different people cosplaying previous versions of ourselves, holding on to something that's not quite true anymore. So it has to be about the journey. It has to be the commitment to go with someone, through something. 
There's no relationship more defining than my early concepts of love than that of my mother. I submit to you that my mother was the greatest mother of all time, with respect to the very good mothers in the room. My mom was, was better. Um, <laughs> speak the truth. That's what they told me. So, <laughs> My mother sacrificed a lot for me to be able to go to a school like this. And I was really aware of it at the time. I saw her second mortgage, the house, to continue paying for me to be here. I saw her put up with emotional abuse at her job, where she stayed in longer than she needed to. I knew the story of her coming up in D.C. herself, surviving gangs and sexual abuse in her own home, told she wasn't smart enough or light enough to be bright enough to do anything of meaning in this world. and. I saw the products of a woman who didn't even graduate college, but became a computer programmer for the federal government of the United States of America, basically a hidden figure. I saw when she declared bankruptcy and she opened up the books to like 10-year-old me. I saw her on a sprained ankle struggle to get to PTA meetings. I saw her get sick with colon cancer, I saw her on her deathbed at age 65. And I remember the things she said to me. Look hard, remember well, question authority, except for hers. <laughs> My mom was the model, and I understood that that was perfection, that was the bar, that's what I got to go for. And I thought loving her meant celebrating her, so I memorialized her in a book right next to Monsieur Gay. I said, this is the greatest. And then I held myself to this impossible standard. And during COVID, I had a lot of time with myself to reflect on who I am, to invest in a relationship with myself, and I didn't like everything I found. There were some habits that I should have let go of a long time ago, some coping styles that helped me when I was younger, which didn't serve me so much when I was older, some mistakes. And some of these things that were part of me, I got them from my mom. And that hurt, man. You think somebody's so perfect, and you realize the imperfect part of you is also part of them, and they're not even alive to have a conversation about it? So I sat with that. I cried through that. I got angry through that. And then I let it go. Because I realized something very obvious and very simple. She is human. Of course she made mistakes. Of course there were things she wasn't taught. So how was she going to teach me? And when I let her be human, I let myself be human. When I allowed her mistakes, I allowed myself mistakes. And when I saw her for the actual person she was, rather than this image I had conjured, I could truly love her. That kind of relationship, that kind of love, that kind of deep knowing is what I want for our relationship with our country. I want us to see the whole picture and the whole story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. To love someone or something is to truly know it. You know that in your own relationships. You know the dirt, and they know yours, and that's part of what makes it love. So let's do that for each other in our society. Let's not be so afraid of teaching ourselves the truth and yet not afraid enough of gun violence in our schools. We fear the wrong things. Show up and participate. Invest in relationship with yourself, others, and the planet around you. Understand power and do all this for the collective. Here's some practical tips I want to leave you with before you commence on into the rest of your lives. First, meditate. It's a good practice. You got a nice start with meeting for worship. I highly, highly recommend it. Second, stay hydrated. You cannot have enough water. Just make sure. Water is life, yo. I'm just not, this is real. I'm trying to give you real stuff. Uh, go outside. There's a whole world. Uh, out there. Get in it. And when you're out there, hug a tree. 
Lay your hands on it. Recognize the value of a tree it isn't just timber to build homes. There are lungs beyond our bodies. They are part of us, and we have a relationship with them too. Eat lunch. <laughs> Some of you may not know this, so I'll say this as a much older person. Uh, these devices, they have a lot of apps on them. One of them is the phone app. Um, and so what this allows for is a synchronous, real-time audio conversation uh, <laughs> with another human being. And, and so, no, hold on, let me just break it down. I feel like Tim Cook up here. This is going to blow your mind. You can talk to other people <laughs> at the same time and listen to them and even see one another. I highly encourage you to make time to connect with each other in person as well. Uh, in the Electoral College, please, it's racist and terrible. Um, let's get rid of fossil fuels. Thank you very much. I like planet Earth. Mars is not it for me. Um, and let's watch the January 6 hearings because insurrection. Most of the stuff that you learned here, most of the things your parents know, most of what we believe, it's just a story. There is no United States of America except what we believe to be true. There is no Sidwell friends. This school ain't even real. The bills are real, but the school, it's just a story. There is no money. There's no dollar. There's no Bitcoin. Truly, there's no Bitcoin. It crashed like terribly. I hoped you got out. Some of you did not. <laughs> Our greatest power is to tell each other a story that we believe in. Then we come together and cooperate and build things in service of fiction. But we get something out of it. We get purpose. We get belonging. We get motivation. We feel seen. I want you to go out there and write your story but not just your individual story. I want you to go out there and write our story. Not alone, but with us. To the parents, the faculty, the staff, the students, to myself, let's write that better story that's big enough to contain us all. Let's show up, let's invest in these relationships, let's understand power, and let's serve ourselves, yes, our collective selves. Congratulations to the class of 2022. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for helping this happen. Thank you.